You thought we were done. You thought there was nothing more to say, didn't you? Didn't you? You thought this was gone. You thought you didn't need me anymore. That 2024 wouldn't have anything that this could tell me. But you're wrong. You're always wrong. That's why I have this. So I can be always right. Anywho, hope you're all doing well. Welcome to 2024. I have things to say. Things to speculate about. That's right. Welcome, one and all, to another tinfoil hat video. It's been a hot minute since I've tapped into powers beyond mortal kind, but it's time. There is a whole fresh year ahead of us that could be full of all kinds of wonderful DLCs and updates. But as I'm sure you've already seen by the thumbnail, giving you a little bit of a hint that you'll need, because of course you don't have one of these, that we're going to be talking about the future of Norska, which you may think, oh, we've been over this. This is going to be like a very simple thing, a very short thing. No, you're wrong again. And here's, as you can see by the timeline, or time, blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean, how long this video is. <laughs> but we are here to discuss every possibility, everything that I can see in the multiverse of what is possible for Norska. And let me tell you, there's a lot. This is gonna be one of those videos where I'm actually gonna bother doing time codes because I normally don't. So, before we get into the really exciting things with DLC possibilities, I think it's important to start with free LC update possibilities because these, frankly, should not be possibilities. These should simply be things that are going to happen. Things that will happen because the foil tells me so. So there's no need for us to worry about these things. Uh, you shouldn't totally make sure that you post about it in appropriate places, such as on the Total War forums or the Discord for Total War or on the Total War subreddit and other places to make sure that CA knows about what they should totally do because I've already seen they're going to do it. So, you know, you don't have to do those things, but of course I can't stop you if you feel inclined to do that. So let's hop into it. First, starting with Norskin Chieftains. So the current Norska roster is not awful. It's a little boring. It's a little dry. You know, they didn't properly salt up the chicken before they put it in the broth. And it's, it just needs a little, needs a little more. And uh, we're gonna pretend that wasn't there. So, <laughs> What do Norskin Chieftains really need? Well, the first thing is that their current skill tree is kind of boring. It's very, very short compared to many other melee specific lords. It does have like an interesting system in that there's a unique tree, so to speak, for each of the gods. You know, you have your Nurgle line, your Slanesh line, your Corn line, and your Zinch line, but you can't really mix and match it or anything super interesting. And it's it's very brief and you don't gain a lot of really good melee stats out of it. So looking at the Norskin Chieftains, they have a skill tree that's a little dry. It's a little beneath what you would expect. It's not as rich as it could be. And the main issue for that lies in the way their melee tree has been developed, where instead of having a regular standard melee tree, you know, a nice big yellow skill line, and then having the unique skills on top of that, they kind of fuse them together where you only have the god specific little mini trees that do give you some nice abilities and buffs, but you miss out on all the regular yellow stat buffs, which sucks because it means your characters are not going to be as fun and powerful as they could be. So what do we need to do with Norskin Chieftains to make them more exciting? Well, the first and foremost thing is that they need a regular yellow skill tree. You know, just the standard buffs that give them access to higher melee attack, higher armor, you know, what you would kind of expect. Something to standardize them a little bit. And then you take those unique little trees that they have, you keep them, and you allow them to still provide you with specialized stat buffs, but you lean more into getting unique abilities. You know, whether it's gaining unique powers that are normally only accessible to the Monogod factions, 
or gaining unique powers that are kind of themed. So like the Nurgle tree maybe could give you regeneration at the very end if you level it all the way up. Or the Slanesh tree might give you the devastating flanker ability uh, lower on the tree, and it also grants you physical resistance as you move up and other things like that. The other thing is, I do think it would be fun to kind of allow the trees to mix and match a little bit. So instead of it being where, oh, you dedicate one point to corn and that locks you out of the other trees, that you should be able to mix and match, but you get a maximum of, say, uh, if the corn tree has one skill that has three points and then a second skill that has three points, maybe it's that you can put six points between all four of them into anything that you want. So you could go two into corn, two into slanesh, and two into zinch. Or maybe it could be that you can put as many points as you want between the first level trees, which are more about stat buffs. But then when you go into the second level, once you've picked one of the second level options, it locks you out of all the other second level options. So for instance, the first coronate ability could give you melee attack, charge bonus, uh, melee attack and charge bonus, let's say for those three points you put into it. But then when you get to the second Cornate Tree uh, skill and you click on that, the first point gives you, maybe it gives you uh, a upgraded Berserker ability to represent, you know, that Norskin Berserker uh, Wrath, but maybe it's an upgraded form. Or maybe uh, it gives you the ability from the blood, the Exalted Blood Letters, where if they kill enough guys, they get a permanent buff for the rest of that battle. You know, something like that. But because you've selected a corn ability rather than just the buff stat, it locks you out of getting the Zinch ability, the uh, Slanesh ability, and the Nurgle ability. That way you could still get the stat buffs and it represents you still getting benefits from the other gods because Norska ultimately should be an undivided experience that allows you to pull in elements from the various gods because Norskan culture is very, very rarely about dedicating to one specific power. Uh, obviously, the Norse campaign kind of at the end ends up building up to you choosing one particular patron above all, but that shouldn't be the, it shouldn't be a rush to that dedicated patron, right? It should be something that you build up to over the course of leveling or over the course of destroying settlements and dedicating god points. So I think that would be the absolute way to go. The other thing is that obviously there should be more passive and active skills from the various mono gods to really incentivize your Norskin lord, your Norskin chieftain, to go one of the mono directions. Where, hey, if you go all the way heavy into corn, maybe you get that the Hellblade ability, where if you get enough kills, you get that perma buff. Maybe you get the Mark of Corn at the end of it, so you get the benefits of having the Mark of Corn, and you also get like further spell resistance, and maybe you also get the. Uh, I forget what it's called, but like the Gore Tide ability or whatever ability it is where when you're in combat, you're healing that the the um, the throne and the skull cannon have. Uh, that would be a really good way to make those characters extremely powerful, uh, especially, you know, you know, you got your chieftain on a mammoth and oh man, he's got that Gore Feast ability. So he's healing when he's in combat because he went big monocorn. That's pretty spicy. Or with Nurgle, if you go all the way down the Nurgle tree, Maybe he gets the slime trail ability, so he, you know, he's resistant to various effects on people and him in close combat. He gets access to Cloud of Flies to debuff enemies that are in combat with him. And maybe he gets regeneration at the end, or he gets poisoned attacks or whatever. You know, Slanesh, you get speed bonuses, but you also get devastating flanker. You get higher physical resistance. Uh, you get access to Sporific Musk. Uh, Soporific Musk, I should say. And... Continuing onward with those kinds of abilities to make those characters really feel like they're almost becoming a part of these other factions and bringing those buffs to that character and maybe also affecting the army as well, where if you get them high enough down that buff tree, perhaps they get some unique gimmicks for their personal army. But that should be more about how you're dedicating your overall faction as opposed to just the Lord themselves. So. The final thing I say with the Norskin Chieftains is that if Creative Assembly really wanted to get all the brownie points, just all, all the points, every point that you could stick on this and put into an oven to get you some delicious brownies, the real thing that would be very cool is if your Norskin Chieftains would actually change visually if you end up dedicating heavy enough to one of the gods. 
So if you end up uh, having your chieftain, instead of having him remain kind of undivided, he ends up going very cornate. He actually gets like a new design and he becomes a marauder chieftain of corn. So he has corn mutations uh, and some kind of like corn theming to him. Same thing with Zinch. You know, he gets maybe, you know, some tentacles going on or he's a little more wizardy looking. Uh, Nurgle, he gets kind of the 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 rusted armor and the, the three-eyed helmets and whatever. So there could be fun ways to make the characters feel a little more dynamic. I don't think that's necessary by any means, but it would be a very, very cool flavor thing. Kind of like how with the Warriors of Chaos, you can dedicate a character to a god by taking their mark. Uh, and therefore you get like a new character. Um, it'd be cool if they introduced uh, Norskin chieftains of the various gods to continue that theme into Norska. Because a, a very heavy aspect of their campaign is dedication to the gods in exchange for rewards. Now, speaking of dedicating the gods for rewards, let's actually talk about the main faction mechanic gimmick of Norska. Which is, of course, that if you are raising settlements and you're performing monster hunts, and you're doing all these epic things in the names of the Dark Gods, that you are supposed to be getting all sorts of kinds of epic rewards. And the real temptation should be to try and lure players or reward players very well for trying to maximize out all of the different trees with the gods as high as you possibly can before dedicating to that final god, which of course... Uh, it, you know, locks you in for the rest of your campaign experience. Make it a temptation to look and go, ah, yes, I could just rush all the way up to tier three corn and lock myself in with corn, or perhaps I should really take my time to go to tier two Nurgle and tier one Zinch and tier one Slanesh before I get all the way up to tier three corn. Could be a very, very interesting way, uh, or could be a fun way to make that campaign a more dynamic experience but the way you got to do that is you really got to make those tiers more exciting and i think the big thing for that is while the current buffs are not bad by any means there should be more to it uh the first and most obvious should be that you should get massive diplomacy buffs with the factions of that respective god as you level them up so once you reach you know your first tier with one of those gods you get like a plus 10 bonus perhaps to all zinch factions let's say because you're going uh the raven god or the eagle god i should say then you reach tier two well that should be maybe plus 25 diplomacy with all zinch factions and if you reach tier three so you hit that that big lock-in you get plus 50 diplomacy with all of those zinch factions or something very big like that so you have some easy friends that you've earned through your dedication to the gods the other thing that i think would be very very nice to really add in some spice is that the max tier for each of the gods should offer a generic ad bonus in addition to the kind of legendary character you get where if you go all the way nurgle or zinch you get that big fancy demonic character and if you go all the way into Slanesh or Korn, you get the fancy legendary hero character. What they should do as well is that if you go all the way to Nurgle, Slanesh, or Zinch, it should allow you to recruit shaman sorcerers and uh, another thing we'll talk about later of that lore of magic. So you should be able to get shaman sorcerers of Zinch or shaman sorcerers of Slanesh or shaman sorcerers of Nurgle. Whereas if it's Korn, they could either introduce a, another character type, or alternatively, they could just buff the hell out of your melee characters. Make it where your, your skin wolves, uh, your, skin, your, your werekin heroes, and your uh, marauder chieftains just go absolute super saiyan as they are engrossed with the power of corn. Uh, you know, whatever way you want to do it, I think there are interesting ways... To provide buffs there but really really reward players for finally going down that final path to god dedication speaking of looking more at faction wide type buffs um another thing that should appear along that god dedication tree is the ability to recruit the god specific marauder units that were introduced in the warriors of chaos roster so i would say either when you dedicate 
to a god, so the third tier, or you've reached the second tier if they want to allow more wiggle room with it, they should you should be able to get the appropriate units of the god in question. So, oh, you've dedicated to Nurgle, or at least reached very, very high um, relations with Nurgle, then you now have access to Marauders of Nurgle, the, the Great Weapon variant, the Sword and Board variant, as well as the uh, the Marauder Chariot, uh, if, you know, like a basic tier chariot, if they have one, uh, and the Marauder Horseman. So they should not get the, you know, super heavily armored Warrior of Chaos units, but they should get the units that have already been designed. I don't think that would be a difficult thing to do, uh, especially because you would only get access to one set of them, so you wouldn't be able to get all four of them. You would just get the one for the god that you end up choosing in the end. Because, of course, with the Norska campaign, you do have to choose one god in the end. That's kind of the ultimate dilemma of the campaign. But it is what adds a little bit of spice. The other thing when looking at monster hunts is obviously we need new monster hunts. Because there's not nearly enough of them. Uh, it would be very, very nice to see new monster hunts added for Kislev, Grand Cathay, and the Ogre Kingdoms. I think it would be quite exceptional to be hunting for an elemental bear, perhaps, along a Kislev storyline, or going after Cathay to hunt a Terracotta Sentinel, perhaps. And then with the Ogre Kingdoms, of course, there's the Thunder Tusk, would I think make for a very, very excellent monster hunt. But I do enjoy the monster hunt missions. They tend to have kind of unique dynamics to them. Some of the older ones that we have probably need a little bit of a looking at, uh, because they tend to rely on certain kinds of special rules, and reinforcement units constantly coming in and every once in a while they just need a little tweaking so if they end up doing this update which of course i do see in the future uh, then it would be very nice to see those older ones just get a glance to make sure everything is working appropriately so continuing on with free lc update type things let's talk about wolfric the wanderer everyone's favorite stoic redhead who's running around talking trash about everybody's mothers and then chopping their heads off because they get really, really salty about it. Wolfric, in my opinion, should be reworked rather heavily in two major ways. The first is that his faction buffs, the things that he focuses on for Kislev, should be kind of rewired, rerouted. Now he's a little bit of a mess between that he sort of buffs the skin wolves, but he also kind of buffs mammoths, and then he kind of buffs other kinds of uh, marauder stuff, but he doesn't really have a spear focus. They sort of just took him and Throg and cut the faction down the middle and just sort of threw things out randomly to each side, which I don't think has held up particularly well. What we need is for them to pick sides that make more sense and then of course to add in more characters that take up more slices of the pie to give us something fun and dynamic so what should wolfric be focused on wolfric the wanderer should ultimately be focused on marauder units he should be focused on your marauder infantry and your marauder cavalry so he should be all about buffing regular marauders your you know your spear throwers your axe throwers your marauder champions of course he should be very heavy into marauder champions and he should also be good at buffing your marauder horsemen and your marauder horse masters that should really be his sphere of influence is to really focus on the humans in his roster who emulate his style of fighting which speaking of which Wolfric should also, in my humble opinion, be given a skill on his uh, skill sheet that allows you, skill tree, allows you to run him the way he was intended, the way that he's always shown case of walking around on foot. He is the world walker. He challenges people to duels. He doesn't bother with horses. He doesn't bother with chariots. He has no need for a mammoth. He kicks ass on foot. And you may say, well, how do we do that? And my answer would be that either on his starting trait or as one of his skills, he should have access to a bunch of buffs that only activate when he is on foot. So if he's on foot, like he is in all of his classic stories and his uh, tabletop version and just every version of him, then he should get tons of buffs to his various stat lines and also get some kinds of resistances. Maybe he gets a heavier mass than you would expect for an infantry character but it allows him to really be kind of this ultimate duelist 
as opposed to more of, if you put him up on the Mammoth, he's going to be better for slamming around armies, wiping out large groups of enemies. But if you have him on foot, you can try and focus him more into being the ultimate character killer. So maybe it could be a combination of when he's on foot, he gives all sorts of different buffs that also activate when he's in range of a character, an enemy character, to really sell that idea. But just a concept. The last thing, and I think the most important thing, is that Wolfric needs to have a much more intimate relationship with Seafang, his legendary longship that can sail the realms of chaos themselves. It shouldn't be a very hard mechanic to implement, but basically the way this should work is that as long as Wolfric is near the ocean or near a port, he should be able to teleport to any port city in the world. Now, there are two different ways you can do this. The first is that you could do this Wood Elf style, where every port in the world is kind of considered something like a, uh, a route for the world routes, and he's able to select a location and teleport to it over the course of one or two turns, where he sort of vanishes from the map, and then he will appear once he has arrived at his destination. The second option is to do it more like Oxyodal's campaign, where you have a little menu that you open up, that you see that the dark gods have sent you a vision. They've sent you a challenge. Someone that you are dedicated to go take down to prove yourself as the world walker. The eternal challenger. And so you have the ability to teleport to where this character is. Or teleport at least to the nearest port near them. Uh, either way I think would be totally fine. I mean Seafang doesn't just show up in ports. It also is able to show up in lakes and ponds and quite frankly any water feature which allows him to get to some truly bizarre places but i do think that would make his campaign feel much more dynamic and allow him and throg to be very different from one another as far as with wolfric you're looking at the true world walking experience as opposed to just conquering norska and then picking a direction whereas with throg you are more about conquering norska and taking the fight to the realms of men but that's enough on Wolfric. Speaking of Throg, and I really mean speaking, I think it would be very well worth Creative Assembly's time and effort to re-record Throg's dialogue. There is an excellent mod that I would like to do a shout out of that I will make sure to pop up here on screen. And I will also have the mod available down in the pinned comment below that you can check out that is a reworked voice line mod for Throg that I think is particularly excellent. It would be nice to see something of at least this quality uh, implemented truly into the game to make Throg's dialogue more consistent with his appearances in every novel he's appeared in, all of his Warhammer Fantasy roleplay appearances, and all of his appearance in the, the main End Times books. It has been established entirely canonically in every single source every single source how throg speaks and the version we have in total war is wrong it's just flat out wrong so having that fixed i think should be a very notable priority moving on to more actual gameplay elements though when it comes to throg like i said him and wolfric kind of suffer from this system but they're kind of focused on everybody i think throg needs to be more laser focused like wolfric should on particular kinds of units and for him, his main focus should be on trolls, obviously, ice worms, the frosty dragons that are very fitting with his ice age or uh, the time of monsters theme, and then Norskin giants, because they're also big bad monsters that are kind of loosely associated with what Throg is going for and building. Of course, Throg, as the Troll King, it would also be very nice to see him have some sort of ability to recruit trolls from other factions, most notably the kinds of trolls that would really be unique to him compared to those that he already has access to. I think the best way to do this without it being as intrusive as a full on new feature that would require like a, un a unique recruitment tab, though I would be fine with that, would be attaching it to his landmark building. So if you build the Lair of the Troll King in the Lair of the Troll King uh, settlement, then there you, instead of it just giving you access to the regular Norskin uh, aligned trolls, it should give you access to all of the relevant trolls. 
And when I say relevant trolls, I of course mean that it should add the following of armored chaos trolls, river trolls, and stone trolls. I believe those are the ones that would be the most likely to appear alongside him, and they would also add kind of unique and dynamic feels into the roster, where your armored chaos trolls, of course, are far more heavily armored, bringing a tankier troll to the mix that's not terribly expensive. Then you have your river trolls, which of course have their unique debuffs, and they're aquatic and have some other fun interactions. And then your stone trolls, which between their increased armor, their increased missile resistance and spell resistance are tanky sons of bitches, especially with their big two-handed mauls. So I think that would add a lot of fun dynamicness to his roster and allow that focus on trolls to be quite exceptional. The last thing when it comes to something that I would consider a free LC addition, because I think it would take minimal work, would be adding... Of course, Sertha Ek, everyone's favorite borderline terrorist from Warhammer 1 as a playable legendary lord due to a legacy, shall we say. So making Sertha Ek playable and allowing him to focus on chariots, that is his gimmick. He buffs the hell out of himself when he's on a chariot. He should add unique buffs to all characters in his faction as a faction effect when they're on chariots. If you have a Marauder Chieftain on a Chariot, he gets access to unique combat buffs. If you have a, sh a Shaman Hero on a Chariot, you get access to unique combat buffs. The more Chariots you have, the more powerful you become, for he is Legion. And of course, the thing I would really like to see with Sertha Ek, along with him, you know, maybe getting a unique voice actor uh, and a unique design to be very fun, would be that he should not ride a Mammoth at his as his final tier mount. Instead, Sertha X should have a unique max tier mount where he rides a wolf chariot. So he rides the ice wolf chariot and he gets all sorts of uh, buffs to uh, ice wolves and chaos hounds in his army. He, uh, so I guess he would be chariots and wolves uh, would be the units that he would buff. But he should also have frostbite attacks. He should still retain the shooting attack. So the guy that's in the chariot with him should be throwing weapons at people since the ice wolf Chariots tend to have a throwing weapon if memory serves. And that would allow him to have a very, very unique dynamic and allow his chariot to be extra fun and spicy uh, between the fact that it slows down enemy units when it strikes them and it also has a shooting attack which allows him for a little bit of harass and he's just fun and different. So, that brings us to the conclusion of the free LC, of course. That was only the things we shouldn't need to pay for. Now, let's get into CA's favorite topic these days, which is money. Or should I say the, the topic that makes them very nervous. So, when we're looking at what things should we be paying for, what things should we add to the game that would be genuinely new. And granted, not all of these would need to be paid DLC, perhaps, but these would be true DLC. This would be content that would need to be added to the game that could not simply be made using assets and concepts that already exist, but instead making something genuinely different. And I have split this up into four little categories, which is that there are three which you could think of as focuses for DLC, and then a legendary hero that's worth talking about very briefly. So the first of the DLCs I think would be the most obvious and the most critical to making Norska feel just like a properly fleshed out faction, which would be Sael the Faithless. So Sael the Faithless was a nightmarish, backstabbing little bastard who comes from a different tribe of chaos up in the chaos waste, but he's known as Sael the Faithless because he's a backstabbing bastard and he's been cast out of his tribe and instead he wanders anywhere and everywhere offering his services as a speaker for the gods and a great advisor. He of course served as an advisor to none other than Tarmacon the Maggot Lord, but that particular relationship did not end up well at the end of things and Sael was never particularly fond of Tarmacon. He more had to serve Tarmacon so he wasn't killed. But what would he be up to if he was out doing his own thing? And I think that's what would bring him to Norska. So Sile the Faithless would arrive for the Norskan roster as the character who has all of the faction buff and focuses on shamans, magic, and mammoths. Because very uniquely, Sile the Faithless is the only well-established chaos character 
who rides a Chaos War Mammoth into battle. That is a mount that he genuinely takes, and he's up there leading lines of mammoths like he did while he was part of Tarmacon's Horde, which fits him perfectly into a Norska roster, as well as being that sorcerer shaman lord character that we really need. As far as what gimmicks does he bring to the campaign, the big thing is that he has a Chaos Spawn pet, you could say, named Nightmaw. And the thing that's particularly terrifying about Nightmaw is it's almost more of a creature of shadow than anything of a real substance. And it's able to appear very suddenly in places you might not expect. So having him as a summonable unit where he arrives on the battlefield and kind of like how Krell currently is, granted we want Krell to change of course, but it should be the similar idea where he's able to choose a place on the battlefield and summon in Nightmaw as something akin to a legendary hero. A very, very powerful chaos spawn that's able to not only protect Sile the Faithless with various abilities, but just go around generally wrecking shop. Furthermore, Sile the Faithless does seem to have a bit of a gimmick around chaos spawn. So it could be that he could get unique access to chaos spawn units. I think that could be something that would be a little exciting and add a little bit more variety to what he would offer in a roster is that he would give you access to just generic chaos spawn. And then once you pick a dedicated God, that of course would uh, also allow you to up, uh, choose the chaos spawn of that God in addition to undivided ones. The other thing is that as far as what units could really come with him that would be particularly exciting, the first, of course, would be a Shaman Sorcerer Lord. Now, I think that name is a little boring, so a more appropriate name might be a Vitki, which the Vitki are these powerful seers that could speak to the gods. They are often the most powerful shamans that you would find in a Norskan tribe, and they speak with an incredible amount of authority. So this would give Norska access, finally, to a generic Lord-level wizard, which would open up so many good avenues for army building because we wouldn't just have Norskan chieftains. So you would get your, they would have the access to the same lores of magic. And once you dedicate well enough to one of the gods, you would be able to also make them a Vitki of Slanesh or Nurgle or Zinch. But in addition to that, I think it would be quite nice for them also to have a little bit of a unique flair. Something I would love to see for the shaman sorcerers and the Vitki would be the idea that, like the Chieftains, they could sort of dedicate themselves to one of the casting gods. So they could be a Shaman Sorcerer focused a little more into Nurgle, or Slanesh, or Zinch. Because one of the things I really, really like is when Lords and Heroes have those kind of skills that unlock at, say, level 15 or level 20, that allow you to spec them into a certain theme, and they get various buffs to maybe some of the heroic actions, Maybe they get access to an unusual ability or an unusual spell, or maybe they get access to just different kinds of buffs. So giving them little fun things, just like we've talked about with the Marauder Chieftains, I think would be quite a good time. And then once you spec to the point where they're able to pick up new lores of magic, well, hopefully then we would get Vitki or Shaman Sorcerer lores that have kind of unique designs that showcase that they're using that particular lore of magic. The other thing that I think would come along very, very nicely with Sile the Faithless, uh, who I imagine would be kind of a smaller expansion because he's kind of one of those things that we really would need to get access to, but there's not a lot of things that I think need to focus on coming with him per se. Uh, but something that could be fun would be the Giant Spined Chaos Beast, which the Giant Spined Chaos Beast is quite literally what it sounds like on the 10. Uh, they can be mistaken for Chaos Spawn, but they're actually not. They're far more stable than they sound. They're these very large, quadrupedal, horrible monsters. We'll have a picture up on screen that you can see that the flesh is literally pulling back over their musculature. They have these big bony spines protruding from their back and other places of their bodies. And they have these huge maws. And they're immensely fast creatures that run across the battlefield. They're monstrous, of course, so they're large. They hit incredibly hard, can devour men in one bite. But what they are in truth are chaos hounds that are often made up of part of the various hordes of chaos, your everyone's favorite little dogs, that have become so heavily mutated and glutted on mutated flesh that they have 
warped and grown until their very flesh begins to split apart because it could no longer sheath all of the muscle that makes up their bodies. And they turn into these horrible, agonizing creatures that are in constant pain, but make themselves feel better by crunching down on the bones of innocents and enemies alike. I think this would be a fantastic new unit to the Norskin roster, but it could also be made available to the Warriors of Chaos and the Beastmen. Obviously, because both of them have access to Chaos Warhounds, and this thing is literally just a big mutated Chaos Warhound. So that would be a very nice unit that would also add to all the Chaos rosters, pretty much, which I think could always be very, very welcome and fits well enough with Sail the Faithless's theme as kind of this Chaos Spawn-focused Shaman Sorcerer who uses magic to make things worse and awful so the second dlc type focus we're going to be looking at is the one that is nearest and dearest to my heart because of course we must speak about the famir the bog people everyone's favorite cyclopean fiends from the deep mists who have been absolutely wonderful ever since they got their pretty serious retcons uh mostly thanks to warhammer fantasy roleplay fourth edition so Leading this little pack of additional extras that I would love to see come to the Norskin roster would be Muna Mim. So Muna Mim, I have done a video purely focusing on her, which I will also have linked down below and somewhere kind of up on screen that you can click on if you want to learn more about her. But she is the one and only official canon Famir matriarch character. There really are no others. Uh, there are some that have appeared in various books and are mentioned, but they all pretty much die. Like, there's one that shows up in the Sigmar trilogy and gets killed, and there's one that's mentioned in a really old Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 2nd Edition story uh, that is dead by the time you find her. But Muna Mim is canon and alive, and she makes for a perfect legendary lord, focusing as our Famir Matriarch, or a Mirg, as they're known, which are immensely large, monstrous, pissed off female Femir that are what lead the Femir clans, the Femir tribes, and are incredibly powerful sorcerers in their own right, usually wielding some form of dark magic or bog magic, depending on how deep you want to go into it. I think giving them either some kind of mix of lores Maybe giving them access to dark magic, which would be quite unique, actually, as that would give us dark magic wizards outside of just the dark elves, which I think would be, and the wood elves, of course, which I think would be kind of fun, uh, something to kind of show how unique they are. Um, but of course, if we could get a lore of the bogs, I would not be complaining because I always love unique lores. As far as what she would really bring to the table, of course, when it comes to her focus on buffs and faction effects and stuff she would be heavily focused on all of the famir units as well as a monster i'm going to talk about in just a moment which i think is great and awesome and we'll talk about how what other kinds of familiar units we can add the other thing that should be uh good for her would be the ability to summon fin beasts as in her personal narrative within warhammer fantasy roleplay fourth edition it's actually talked about that because uh, she is so old, she has outlived her clan very tragically and thus has fin beasts that she summons that kind of follow her around because she dislikes dealing with demons because she finds them to be treacherous business partners and annoying at the best of times. But as far as what would fin beasts actually do, uh, if you've never seen them, they're quite famous Warhammer fantasy monsters often summoned by the truth seer, uh, truthsayers and dark emissaries from Albion. But they are these immense swamp beasts that are created by magic. And they're, you can kind of think of them as swamp golems, for lack of a better term. The other thing that would be nice about this is this could potentially just add fin beasts into the game if they have not already been added. And this would allow them to be available to more factions, potentially as a summonable unit. As fin beasts are often associated with many types of druids and other types of wizards that uh, uh, visit the swamps of the world it's actually not that unusual to see them around but they could make for a fun unit and many different rosters is just kind of a generic monstrous infantry unit but for muna mim they should definitely be a summon i personally very much hope to see them one day as part of either a dogs of war type upgrade uh perhaps being part uh if we ever got a marienburg faction they could be a part of that or an albion faction if we ever got that uh but that's not what we're talking about today 
As far as new generic characters would go, we would of course need the Famir Noble. The Famir Nobles being the biggest, beefiest, baddest uh, Famir who carry uh, whether I think because the Marauder Chieftain, if I recall correctly, tends to be more Axe and Shield. The Famir Noble, you'd probably want the big two-handed variant. That way he could focus on anti-large combat and would be really good for dueling uh, monsters and other large characters. He would also have all the usual buffs you would expect with Famir, where he's got the high missile resistance, and he's got the little mist passive ability, and he also, when he hits people, he causes their armor to shred, because Famir are fantastic for that. Plus, this would give us a generic monstrous character uh, to lead armies with the Famir, which would be awesome for Throg as well as... Uh, the Famir, because Throg does like having monstrous boys running around, and as do the Famir. As far as other things that would come with it, uh, for a new unit, Shurls could be a very, very good one, which Shurls are the lowest class of Famir society. They do not have the bony clubs on the end of their tails. They also don't have the big turtle shell things on their backs. They're far more naked looking, but they are still Famir, which means they are large. They are big boys. Um, and one of the things that would be uh, nice to see with them is just getting access quicker to Famir units in your roster. Having more of a tier 2 unit that uh, is not as well armored, not as well equipped. They don't have the fancy armor sundering ability, but, you know, they would still have the mist power. So they would still have a good amount of physical or missile resistance, I should say, uh, due to the fog that and the mist that constantly covers them. But they're not nearly as dangerous and are more for giving you cheap access to a monstrous infantry unit that can be helpful on the flank or maybe for getting into archer units and smashing them down but should probably not be terribly good against armor and should have you know you would probably get better use generally out of trolls because the trolls would come with regeneration uh, and other nice features but the shurls could perhaps be a very uniquely cheap unit of monstrous infantry which is not something we see a lot of in Total War Warhammer. And then the last thing that would be nice to come with the Famir, and granted, this thing could come with the Famir, but it could also come with Sile the Faithless. Uh, I think either pack would fit it just fine, would be the Cursed Etons. Uh, I've spoken about the Cursed Etons a few times before. I did a Monstrous Arcanum episode on them way back in the day during an October series, but they are a very specifically Norskin monster. They were originally a Norskin tribe that did something to anger the gods, and they were hit with a horrible curse that caused all of them to basically be fused, uh, all the individuals in the tribe to be fused into these horrible two-headed monsters, where one of the heads is uh, relatively intelligent and has the ability to cast spells, while the other one's more of a babbling idiot, but is incredibly strong. Many of them have these horribly mutated, like, hammer fists, where instead of having, like, fingers, they just have a big meat club for a hand that allows them to absolutely obliterate people by smashing them with it. They're relatively the size of giants, so they're absolutely huge creatures, but they're very, very malicious and cruel, and some of them have access to magic. So giving Norska access to a really big, fat monster that has bound spells as well as access to several unique passive and active abilities to really set them apart from giants but you know where giants are more into just dealing pure raw damage and having just absolutely crazy health bars the cursed Etons are not quite as big into the health bar and are not quite as good at just dealing raw damage but they're able to help you out with other passive abilities and the fact that they would have bound spells which would be quite nice and that of course leads us on to the final DLC group type recommendation, though we will talk about Legendary Heroes at the very end here, which is Bjorg Bearstruck, who is just an absolutely fantastic kick-ass type of character. So Bjorg Bearstruck is your werebear legendary lord. This is a very dedicated Norskin man who worships the dark gods, who originally featured back in the Dogs of War, uh, even though he was kind of a horrifying monster of a man. And he quite literally can turn into a werebear. He mutates at will into a giant, horrible bear monster of chaos that rips people apart with ease. And he is just terrifying. And he's followed by the bear men of Urslo, 
uh, which follow him around and are kind of like a dedicated, you know, they were his regiment for the good old regiments of renown, the Dogs of War book. But Bjorg Bearstruck, uh, I would have him be your big bad werebear character. Uh, if they wanted to make it where he could transform between an infantry version and the bear version, they could. I personally think it wouldn't be necessary. I think just having him always in bear form would be totally fine uh, to help make him feel very, very dynamic and different from Wolfric over there. Because uh, I don't, you know, his bear form would be better all the time unless you're just really, really wanting a specific uh, defense. But like we have with Malice and the Cathayans, it could be very, very interesting to have him have an infantry version where maybe he has uh, a shield and so he's he's you know he's infantry sized and he's better at not getting hit by anti large stuff he's less exposed to missile weapons and he has missile resistance and then if you use of course and maybe he even has access to certain kinds of abilities that are more about like buffing nearby troops but then when he transforms into his bear form of course he becomes a colossal uh bear that is you know a big um when I say colossal, I don't, he's not elemental bear size by any means, but he is notably larger than a skin wolf werekin. You know, he's the, he's kind of a size tier above that. Still kind of in that monstrous infantry category, but he would kind of be right at that threshold between monstrous infantry and monster. He'd be, he'd be really skirting that line. As far as what kind of units he should focus on, obviously he would be your big wear units buffer. Um, Though I could also see the argument that uh, he should also be focused on your Chaos Warhounds and your Norskin Ice Wolves as well. Um, I think you could have a bit of an argument about whether the Warhound should go to more like Sirtha Ek or whether they should go more to Bjork Bearstruck, but it doesn't really matter as long as somebody gets them. In any event, as far as what would come with him, uh, I would bring him Werebears or Skin Bears or whatever they want to call him as a new monstrous infantry unit that's very, very elite. More like monstrous cavalry, to be honest, than monstrous infantry. So kind of more like your dragon ogres or uh, other creatures like that, where they're quadrupedal and they charge into combat and absolutely are wrecking and shrecking people, but they're not mounted, so they're not technically monstrous. You get the point. Monstrous beasts, shall we say, as opposed to monstrous infantry. And they would be uh, your very, very heavy, hard-hitting uh, ones that you are more meant to throw into combat, and they stick in combat, as opposed to skin wolves, which seem to tend to be more kind of a hit and retreat. As far as how well armored they were would be or anything like that, you know, ultimately I think that would be up to the developers just to dis uh, fit them up uh, to be whatever works best for what would supplement the Norskin roster. I think the more monstrous elements we can add to really build up that aspect of the Norskin roster and show why they have kind of a cultural focus versus, say, the Warriors of Chaos that makes them unique would be very, very good. Especially because bears are fucking terrifying and they're awesome and huge and we need more bear units that are not Kislev, <laughs> I should say. Uh, that being said... They could also take a different route where, you know, I wouldn't want them to be bear bears like Kislev. They should be horribly chaos mutated were bears. So just like how your skin wolves are not just big wolves, they're werewolves. Uh, you would want to do the same thing with the were bears or the skin bears where uh, they have kind of like man like features and their limbs are not right. And the way looking at them, they, they don't look like bears. You would never truly mistake them for a bear. Um, there's something that's approximately a bear, should we say. As far as other type of units that could come uh, with this kind of focus, and granted, any of the units that I'm talking about that could be added as additions, I think would be perfectly fine uh, being added wherever. They don't necessarily need to come with the character I'm putting them with. I just kind of wanted to put something with everyone. Uh, but I think that, you know, the Giant Spine Chaos Beast could come pretty much anywhere. The Cursed Eden could come pretty much anywhere. Um, for these, there are two options that I think could be quite interesting. Uh, the first would be getting a new Marauder Champion unit. So getting something that's the same tier as Marauder Champions, but has a focus on anti-large. Because currently, Norska doesn't really have anything above low tier anti-large when it comes to their infantry. You have your Norskan Spearmen, and then your Javelin Throwers, and that's about it, which are both low tier. They're not even mid-tier units. Uh, the Marauder Champions only have the Great Weapons and the Sword and Board, which are still very strong units, but don't have that focus there. I think having a um, 
melee variant of the Marauder Champion that is focused on uh, killing sea monsters, fighting plague krakens in the Sea of Claws would be a perfect new unit. Maybe they could even be called Kraken Slayers or something along the lines that kind of demonstrates them as slayers of great, mighty, huge sea beasts. And they could have harpoons or some kind of specialized spears that are meant for fighting on the longships at sea, but have proven just as valuable at killing dragons or trolls or other large creatures, demigriffs, uh, tree men, whatever have you. And so that would give Norska a new elite tier, uh, Marauder champion tier, you know, just like Marauder champions, they're more heavily armored, far more elite, yada, yada, but they have some form of anti-large weaponry. The last unit that I think would be worth adding is that the Norska we are really leaning into in the Total War series is truly the most dangerous aspects of Norska. It is all the most horrible, monstrous elements of Norska with all of the more reasonable, typically more southern tribes, kind of trimmed off, to be frank, to make them more appropriate for the scope of Total War, which is, of course, a war game, not a cultural exploration RPG game. So the last unit that I think would be really fun to explore would, of course, be Mutants, a very heavily mutated unit, which there are two kind of options you can look at. A very heavily mutated or mutilated um, infantry unit that if we pull from the lore of the roleplay game could be individuals known as Dark Souls, which, yes, I know, memes aside, um, literally the Dark Souls of Warhammer, I know. But Dark Souls are individuals who allow themselves through ritual to be possessed by a demon. And the demon basically hollows them out, it, it eats their soul, but it makes them into incredibly powerful individuals were immensely dangerous. Most Dark Souls were seen for the first time uh, during the Mordheim Crisis, uh, but some escaped, and people with the knowledge of how to make them, escaped north into Norska and started to create these kinds of individuals more regularly. What's very disturbing about Dark Souls is they're not possessed. Very specifically, they are not possessed individuals. The demons do not stay inside of them. Instead, the demon comes into their body, eats a lot of them, uh, their soul, so to speak, not their actual innards, but their soul, but it grants them a form of power in exchange. And it leaves a horrifyingly cruel, evil, sinister force behind that makes for an excellent warrior or someone who wants a shortcut to power at the cost of a considerable portion of their sanity and soul. But a unit of Dark Souls could be a really fun kind of... Um, berserker type unit that aren't like the marauder berserkers uh you could either have them just being a more elite version or being a version that focuses more on magical attacks you know where instead of going into combat um and relying on their twin axes they're more fighting with claws or mutations like they've got spines coming out of their arms and stuff like that um but i think that can make for a very very fun unit alternatively they could be called flayer kin the Flayerkin uh, were a concept that were introduced in the Storm of Chaos back in the end, uh, near the end of 6th edition. And the Flayerkin are quite horrifying individuals, to be honest. They are men that are driven absolutely insane uh, by their worship and belief in chaos to the point that they are heavily mutilated either by themselves or by would-be or what should have been allies. And often they have limbs chopped off their hands removed and implanted with like uh with some kind of spikes or swords or axes or war picks so they uh they have helmets welded to their heads and they are completely crazed maddened screaming individuals that depending on which version you're looking at uh, you could consider them to be relatively well armored because a lot of weapons and armor are quite literally melt fused or melted into their flesh or you could argue that they're not well armored at all because while they have often helmets or other metal pieces kind of integrated into them it's not truly a suit of armor by any means uh, oftentimes they were used in sieges because they could literally climb up walls uh, using the weapons that were kind of embedded into them and they were a, a horrific entity that was uh, that arrived 
alongside um, Archaon's hordes from the north, but they could fit very easily into a Norskin roster to explore the much more depraved aspect of what Chaos Worship does to someone. Um, and I think they actually do fit quite well, once again, as kind of a more, uh, more heavily mutated or uh, disturbing aspect of Berserker culture. So where you have your regular Marauder Berserkers who are individuals that are starting along that path but have retained their humanity in many ways, you could have the Flarekin or the Dark Elves, Dark Elves, Dark Souls, representing the other half of that coin, where these are individuals in a berserker culture who have lost themselves to that berserker range to the extent that they have done things to themselves, either their soul or their flesh, that has driven them to madness in a form of berserker rage that never ends. As far as the very end, when it comes to legendary heroes, I have done a legendary hero video dedicated to every single race back in the day. Uh, not that crazy long ago, but something we might revisit in the near future. Uh, but uh, I have done an episode for Norska, which I will have linked if you want to go watch it and get all the fancy little details. But when it comes to legendary heroes, I would love to see come in a sort of Norska update. The one that jumps to head for me the most is a legendary hero who's actually from Norska. He himself is a Norskin, which is of course Sila Anfringrim, who is technically a chaos spawn, but he's a very unique chaos spawn. He's a chaos spawn in the sense that he's completely lost his mind and lost himself to savagery, but, and he is Cornate. Uh, he is a Cornate character. However, uh, he is maintained, he's kept by his home tribe. His tribe kind of treats him as like a prized pet. Uh, a, a mascot in a sense that represents their dedication to the dark gods and he is kept by them uh, either in a cage or held by chains but they bring Sila with them to battlefields and join up with other Norskin tribes to unleash Sila upon their foes so Sila fights alongside Norskin tribes and from a lore standpoint he is a Norskin war beast even though he's a chaos bond which often causes people to think that he's purely Warriors of Chaos. And obviously he's from the Warriors of Chaos book, but so are Throg and um, Wolfric. Uh, or they think of him as Cornate, simply because he has the Mark of Corn. but it's not quite that simple. Uh, he's, he's a far more um, complex character. And from a lore standpoint, he is used as part of Norskin armies, as opposed to true Warrior of Chaos legions. He doesn't actually start really appearing regularly as part of Chaos Hordes until the end times, when Archaon sort of absorbs everything as he goes south. So I think Sila Amphrigam added as a legendary hero, but just like we've been seeing with legendary heroes that have been added, he should be appropriate, he should be available to all the factions for which it makes sense. So while he should predominantly be considered a Norskin legendary hero, he should also be made available to the Warriors of Chaos and to the Korn Monogod factions, because he would fit just fine within those. Um, honestly, I think the more we add legendary heroes, if it's appropriate for them to join more armies, I think we should always go for that option. It's really awesome to see Ulrika fighting for Kislev and the Empire, or, um, seeing, uh, the Zinch characters appearing in both the Warriors of Chaos and Zinch. You know, keeping that going, I think, is by no means a bad thing. And Silent Anfringrim, I don't think he should be locked at all by any means behind you going monocorn. He should be available to any of the Norskin uh, factions, regardless of which god they end up going, uh, because he himself does not care for who he fights. Uh, his tribe drags him around to fight for other Norskin tribes, and he shows up anywhere. He is a mindless, raving beast. He doesn't care if who he's fighting for is a Slanesh horde, or a Cornate uh, horde, or a Zinch horde, or a Nurgle horde. All he cares is about kill for corn, kill for corn, kill for corn. And Norskins, uh, of course, you're ultimately an undivided faction that can go Monogod by the end. But even if, if you do go Monogod, uh, many of your individual characters are not probably going to be focusing on that god. You know, you can spec them to go any way you want, which I think is the beauty of Norska, of being a undivided faction that's able to bring in elements from the other gods um, and end up kind of focusing into one of them without it being such a heavy focus that you end up just playing a monogod faction at that point. You know, they're not like Daniel uh, in that sense. They're, 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 I think, more open. Man, I just kind of realized that Daniel really just kind of like st 
stole a lot of his stuff from Norse Gun. I think he just does it worse. But that's a video for another time. In any event, uh, this thing is starting to leach into my head. And my doctor told me that if I leave it on for more than uh, two hours that I need to call them. So I need to hurry up and find a way to pry this thing off before it saps any deeper into my brain. And until next time, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think down below. What are the elements that really jump out at you? Uh, is there anything on here that is on a must have list for you? Is there anything that you don't think is appropriate or doesn't fit, or you really wouldn't want to see added, whether you got it for free or had to pay for it? Um, are there any elements here that you think you would be worth paying for? Or are there any things here that you say, no, this should absolutely be free. We should get this, but it definitely should be free of charge and just be like a casual update to the faction. Do let me know down below as well as any ideas you may have for the future of Norska. Now, I am going to stop looking to the future and I need to get back to dealing with the old world. So thank you all very much for watching. I'll see you again soon.